Yeah, it's just, just people need to, like, I don't know, um, not be afraid to ask a question if they want to know something of dancing. Um, get out there and have a go. Wait for that one moment when it feels right and then just take that first step. And once you start, you know, just keep going. It's easy to keep going once you start. And the first step's usually the hardest one. Any sort of style of music, or any style of dancing, or any style of graffiti, it's got to start from somewhere. It was the summer of love, you know, it was all about, it was that 80s post hippie type of mentality, you know, flower power and all that rubbish. Um, just people were into dancing and having a good time. Back then it was just a blend of commercial house music, house music, underground techno, whatever. Um, you know, things didn't go too fast. Things were around, say, 125 to 130 BPM. Um, some dudes would drop in like slower tracks, like, um, you know, just soul to soul, things like that. Just all different types of stuff. Um, it wasn't relegated to, you know, like one certain style and one certain thumping kick drum or whatever. In 1989 and stuff, if you went to a rave, the DJ would play hip hop, house, and those were saying about a tempo. If it was the right tempo, it didn't matter what style of track it was. Most of the plays were so called illegal, like you know, they were pretty small, several hundred people uh, initially, and just in people's houses, warehouses, uh, bars, when you could con them into it, um, wherever you could find the space. The chapel, as far as I can tell, and I used to go out a lot at the time that it sort of started and never saw it anywhere else. There was once, I saw this guy called Andrew, this English guy, um, that we used to live in Sydney, that moved to England and had just moved back to Australia and settled in Melbourne, who was a photographer. There was a 
bunch of dudes from um, England that came out during that 89, 90 period. They stayed for a whole year because they just loved the scene here and everybody was really friendly to them and you know, they just usually went out five nights a week or six nights a week and just partied hard. And um, he was doing this dance in the corner and me and, friend, me and a couple of friends were just like, what's this guy, you know? And we'd seen him a few times. We'd, we'd seen him before, but from a distance. And then we were at a Commerce Club. Commerce Club was like a really underground kind of club. I guess very similar to Razor, which was a Friday night club that used to run like for the house heads and, you know, all the Molly Melger used to go there and Michael Hutchinson, Kylie Minogue and those sorts of people. It was a real kind of scene, music scene place. But all they played was house music. And Commerce Club was the exact same kind of scene kind of place, really trendy and just like really cool and underground, but it was for electronic music, it was more house. That's where tech, like a lot of techno stuff, rave stuff, like Terry Terry Ho used to play there. He used to run Octave Records and Jason Ripple used to work there. Um, I used to play there a little bit, Willie Tell, Ollie Olsen, like it was a really good place. Commerce wise, when I spun there, we used to get loads of people in, mainly because it was the only place back then that was open until 9 o'clock in the morning um, where, you can kept, where you can keep on drinking until 9 o'clock and that was fine. Um, that and Razor were the only two sort of like underground clubs in Melbourne. Their, their licensing, their whole license, their alcohol license wasn't a proper nightclub license. They, they weren't actually nightclubs, they were just like, just a men's club really that, you know, had a really old, archaic drinking license dating back to the 50s and 30s. And that's where we saw this guy, Andrew, and he used to go there every Saturday night, and we saw him about the second or third weekend that he'd been in Melbourne, we saw him, and he just, somehow he found out that was a place to come, and he just came there, and he was just doing this crazy, like, dance with his feet, and back then, I mean, people used to do, like, the acid house kind of thing, and, you know, stand there and do all sorts of stuff, but nothing like this, you know, it was really like, uh, we were just like, fuck, what's going on here? This guy's like, crazy, <laughs> you know, like, we couldn't believe it, and then we just walked up, started talking to him, like, oh, dude, yeah, this is amazing, what are you doing, and stuff, and we, a few of us started to copy it. Um, when I first met, met Richie Rich, he was, like, a bussy at Chevron, the Chevron nightclub in St Kilda Road. Um, he used to come down to Commerce all the time and just hassle the crap out of me, asking him what that tune was. And, um... Yeah, so I just kept sort of practicing and stuff, and then a few friends of mine, we, we used to always sort of dance together, and as you do in your groups, and you kind of go the effort of getting dressed up before you go out together, and putting on your outfits and stuff, and, and dancing in front of the mirror and shit like that. I'm sure he did bust a few shuffle moves. Everyone was still doing this acid house kind of thing, and had bandanas on and whistles and smiley face t-shirts, and no one was doing this stuff, so it would have been like 89, some sometime in 89. Um, and then we started this little dance troupe thing where there was a group of us and we started doing like little routines with the hats like they do now and all this kind of stuff and like sort of, a bit like break dancing, is, you know, where you sort of like you're in a group and you're all sort of body pop and pass the current on to each other and then the next guy does his thing. We used to do the same kind of thing and at the start of 1990 when Mark James and, um, and um, Paul O'Loughlin started a club called Pure, which was the first ever rave club in Melbourne, and that was at the back of the palace. Because it went from like 300 people to all of a sudden every week, like 800 kids. So over a month, you know, there might have been 1,500 unique kids coming and getting into this style of music and this style of fashion and this kind of dancing routines and the whole package that comes with being a raver. DJ gigs, all of a sudden I had a gig every week as opposed to every three weeks, and Willie Tell had a gig every week, and some of us had two gigs a week. It was like, man, this is going off. And then, um, and that was pretty much, yeah, that, that was kind of that 1989 to 1990 explosion when it just went through the roof and that's when I started Hardware. And then basically in about 1993 was when every picture kind of found their spot and we found our spot and that was a real, that was the next big turning point when the numbers really started to grow steadily and also I guess um, the scene kind of became like a really strong kind of force. Um, and that also made the shuffle kind of explode. The every picture parties, whenever they did a party, they did a party. Um, decor was changed every time and, and that's that's one of the reasons why I think every picture